so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters this podcast was recorded on. It's November 30, 2021, and the 1,200 students at Oxford High School in Michigan are filing back to class after their lunch break. There's chatting and laughing, kids running up and down the hall, doors being opened and closed, teachers calling out for order, everything you would expect at 12.50pm on a Tuesday afternoon. But the normalcy comes to an end in an instant, as gunshots echo down the halls. A boy, armed with a gun, has started shooting his classmates. More than 100 911 calls are made during the next few minutes. The two roads leading to the school are blocked as emergency services swarm. Children, teenagers, lay bleeding and dying as the shooter, a child himself, goes classroom to classroom. And as quickly as it starts, it's all over. The 15-year-old shooter spent just nine minutes hunting down victims and unloading rounds before being apprehended by police. But in those nine minutes, he changed the small town of Oxford forever. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. What a 15-year-old student unleashed on his high school in 2021 didn't just land himself in prison. He took his parents down with him. Our guests today have chosen not to name the teenager, to deny him the satisfaction he so desperately craves. So we're following their lead. School shootings aren't uncommon in America, but this school shooting was. Jennifer and James Crumbly became the first parents convicted in a US mass school shooting, and it was no small sentence. They each received at least 10 years in prison. In handing down their sentences, the judge said the convictions were not about bad parenting. It was about repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train. It was about repeatedly ignoring things that would have made the hair stand up on the back of a reasonable person's neck. It was about being criminally negligent. Their son had meticulously planned, talked about and journaled about his plans to become the next school shooter on multiple occasions. I can't stop thinking about it. Like, it's constantly in my head. Every conversation I have with someone, no matter what, I'm thinking about it and I can't get it out. On the day he followed through, his dad feared the worst. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Okay, I, I'm not really sure. I'm at my house. There's an active shooter situation going on at the high school. My son goes to the high school. I have a missing gun at my house. I need an officer to come to my house right away, please. Okay, I'm not going to be able to send anybody to your house right now. So they're, they're, okay. um, they're on the active shooter situation right now. I understand um, that. There's a million a cops there. I have a missing gun, and my son is at the school, and we had to go meet with the counselor this morning because of something that he wrote on a test paper and then i i was in town and i saw a whole bunch of cops going somewhere and i made sure that i i, I wanted to get to the high school to see something was going on in the high school and then somebody told me that there was an active shooter and then i raced home just to like find out okay and i think my son took the gun i don't know if it's him i don't know what's going on i'm what's your son really saying? freaking out Jessica Lauber and Cooper Moll are the producers behind Sins of the Child, a new seven-part podcast series investigating the Oxford High School shooting and the Crumbly family. Their analysis aims to unpick some of the most complex questions within this story about community, school responsibility and the role parents have in their children's lives. To tell us about the case and their findings, Jessica and Cooper join us now. I want to start with Oxford, the place. From what I'm gathering, it's quite a small town, country vibe. Talk me through it. Oxford itself is a town of about 4,000 people. It's a small town. 
and it is quite conservative. It resides somewhere in the 70 most affluent counties in the country. So most of the folks there are wealthy. It is definitely a quaint, small town. Everybody knows everybody. It definitely kind of harkens back to a 20th century sitcom like Leave It to Beaver or one of those more suburban landscapes with the picket fences and the clapboard houses and manicured lawns and cul-de-sacs and, you know, the kind of place where kids are playing in the neighborhood and it feels safe to be there. One thing about Oxford is a lot of people come there, you know, from the Detroit metro area on the weekends to patronize. They've got like a town square that is actually a United States historical site. It's very colonial, lots of breweries and pizza parlors and gift shops and, you know, artisanal goods. And two things that are very big in Oxford are equestrian life. So people are really into horses there. And another big part of the culture is guns. And people are very into hunting there. And it is not uncommon certain times of the school year. I'm not too sure if this is still a thing, but school will begin later in the day. So families and their children can hunt in the morning before school. So guns are definitely a big part of the culture there. It's a much more conservative township. And another thing about it is if you have kids, everybody goes to Oxford High School. That is the high school there. And one of the things that Cooper found in her research was that football was what really put this area on the map for Oxford. And if you knew about Oxford, you knew about them because of their football team. And, you know, Friday Night Lights is kind of like the vibe in that town. Everybody goes to the games on Friday nights until this tragedy happened. From the outside, as an Australian looking into America, school shootings seem to have some kind of regularity over there. We don't have that kind of thing happen at all, really, here. So when we look over there, we see it as quite a common thing. But I've seen a lot of commentary about Oxford saying that that particular place, it was a surprise for something to happen like that there. Why is that the case? Gosh, I mean, I would imagine, you know, from how it's been characterized, the subjects that we've spoken to and in my research is that it seems like the type of place where people really look out for one another. People have known one another's kids since they were babies. Teachers there have taught generations of a family. But another thing about it is people who have been in Oxford have lived there for a long time. It's not necessarily the type of place you go and transplant to. From what I understand, there is a certain type of, you grow up there, you stay there, you raise your family there, your kids then raise their family there. So I think that there's not a lot of stranger danger going on there. And everybody's kind of keeping tabs on everybody, not in a nefarious way. It's just, there's a palpable community there. And like you say, Oxford High is where everyone goes. So take us there on November 30, 2021. The school is sent into disarray when someone starts opening fire. Where do the gunshots start and what do the next few minutes, because it really is only minutes, what do they look like? So this is essentially what happens. On November 30th, 2021, 12.51 p.m., just after the lunch hour for the students, gunshots that many students have now described as the sound of balloons popping began to come from the south end of the main hallway where students have their lockers, etc. And within one minute, so now it's 12.52 p.m., there have been over 100 phone calls to the local 911 dispatch center. And the cops are already on their way there. Reporters and cops have already caught wind of this. So the nature of this is spotty details are emerging. You've got tons of scared kids calling their parents, calling 911 operators, and they can't really answer questions as to what they're seeing because they're concerned about barricading themselves, running away, et cetera. So, From the hallway, the shooter starts to make his way east through the building, indiscriminately striking students. He is not targeting people he personally knows or has any personal vendettas against. It is complete indiscriminate killing. And 
the first person he shoots is a young girl running down the hallway. And then he shoots another girl in the back of the head. And this is particularly eerie because in the manifesto, if you will, the tape he recorded the night before the shooting, and we can get into that later, clearly states that the first person he wants to shoot is a pretty girl in the face. And that is precisely what he did. So at this point, somehow parents have already caught wind of what's going on. And we're only about like two, three minutes into this shooting. Somebody posts onto a Oxford mom's Facebook group and certain parents are driving towards the school, but the streets have been barricaded because law enforcement is shutting down the roads into the school because they don't know if the shooter is a student yet. So if the shooter got there by car, they want to make sure he or she cannot leave by car, right? So shooter still moving east down the hallway. Students and teachers are barricading themselves in classrooms here in America because this is not a super one-off event here, as we just recently talked about. Typically in school, you do active shooter drills. So the teachers and the students had already been you know, privy on what to do. So we're about two, three minutes into the shooting. The shooter changes magazines and then starts heading north up the hall. He turns around, shoots into a classroom, walks south again. I can't even imagine what's going on in the panic these students are feeling inside the classroom at this time. Then three minutes after the first shots were heard, the shooter enters the boys' bathroom and encounters two students, a senior and a freshman. Inside this bathroom, the senior is instructing the freshman to hide in the stall so that the shooter cannot see their feet, to get up and crouch down on the toilet. So the shooter walks in once, he leaves. The two boys are left in the stall hiding, texting their parents what's going on. The shooter then comes back back into the bathroom, orders the senior to come out of the stall and the freshman to stand up against the wall. He then shoots the senior right in front of the freshman. And that is the last person he shoots, 17-year-old Justin Schilling, before the gunfire ceases around 12.56 p.m. when the first two deputies come into Oxford High School and begin to search for the shooter with guns drawn at around 1 p.m. So this is only nine minutes after the first shots rang out. He steps out of the boys' bathroom and kneels down and puts his hands up, which is somewhat an anomaly in these circumstances. We hear a lot of times the assailant will either turn the gun on themselves or maybe antagonize law enforcement so they can do suicide by police. We've seen that happen before as well. So law enforcement that we've spoken to tell us that the whole thing was really, and this may sound crude, wrapped up in about 13 to 15 minutes. It's amazing how much damage someone can do in such a short period of time. One of the key interviews that we did for Sins of the Child was with Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard. His team was the team that responded to the high school that day. They had been trained for this. They found 18 live rounds left in his gun. They firmly believe that he planned to shoot every single one of them. But we know from listening to his manifesto that he planned to surrender. He did not want to kill himself. He did not want to do suicide by cop. He wanted to surrender. And he says it's because he wanted the notoriety. He wanted people to use his name and forever associate him with this terrible act. We choose not to use his name in the podcast. Some of our contributors do. We're not going to stop them from doing that, but we don't use his name. Yeah, it does become clear he did have this obsession with notoriety, wanting to be remembered as a school shooter and stay alive, not kill himself. And there are a few instances where he references the Parkland school shooter as his idol. Before we get into that, I'd like to know a little bit more about the victims because we had four people killed, multiple people injured. Can you tell us a little bit about some of them and some of the people that lost their lives that day? So 
by the end of the day, it was reported that three teenagers had died. So 17-year-old Madison Baldwin, 16-year-old Tate Meir, and 14-year-old Hannah St. Juliana. And at the time, I believe that there were seven other injuries, many of them critical, including one teacher, and that was Molly Darnell. And by the next morning, December 1st, 2021, news had broke that 17-year-old Justin Schilling, who was the senior in the bathroom with the freshman, did not survive his injuries. So in total, there were four victims. We use a lot of trial audio in the podcast from multiple hearings, and the parents each had a trial. And so one of the biggest pieces of tape that we use in our show, we have an entire episode dedicated to the victim impact statements. And that's because we want to keep the victims at the forefront of this. And at the victim impact statement or at the sentencing hearing for the shooter, the victims were invited to give their victim impact statements. And that included Justin Schilling's parents, Jill Suave and Craig Schilling. Madison Baldwin's mother spoke, Nicole Beausoleil. And Hannah St. Juliana's sister and father spoke, Steve St. Juliana and Raina St. Juliana. Raina spoke on behalf of her mother as well, because I have to imagine that it was extremely difficult for her mother to face the idea of standing up in front of her daughter's killer and reading a statement. I know that I could never. And for Tate Muir, his father really gave one of the most impactful statements that I've ever heard in my life. They spoke about their kids' dreams and what their futures would have been and what they imagined their futures to be for themselves and for their relationships with their children, but also for their children. You know, Steve St. Juliana says, I'm never going to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle. I'm not even going to be able to see her graduate high school. She just started high school three months before this. Her sister says that they were super close. They shared clothes, like they talked about everything. And now her sister doesn't even want to get her driver's license because what's the point? Her sister's not there to be with her anymore. And Steve also said that he found a list of careers that Hannah was considering, a list of careers in her phone. And so these kids had such bright, bright lives ahead of them, and they were just snuffed out through the aspirations of a deranged killer. And it's not just those that died. It's the injured, but also the friends that watched these people die, the students that were terrorised. So many people are impacted when something like this happens. Yes. I think one of the more compelling moments for me in Jill Suave, Justin Schilling's mom's testimony, when she spoke of her son, she talks about her son's heart and his character and who he was as a person. And she specifically says that her son, Justin, would have been the shooter's friend had he just asked. And something about that, I think, tells you a lot about who Justin Schilling was as a person. And we had an opportunity to speak with his father, Craig, and that came through in our conversation with him as well. But yes, to your point about, you know, all the others affected, that is really was the impetus for Karen McDonald charging the shooter with one count of terrorism, which we have not seen before in a school shooting. And why is that? What difference does that make? Well, it doesn't necessarily make a difference, but it makes a statement. It doesn't bring anyone back. It doesn't heal anybody's trauma, but it it definitely makes a statement that this affects so many more people than the people killed in their families, right? I mean, additionally, in the shooter sentencing hearing and the parent sentencing hearings, we hear from survivors who talk about the PTSD they are now living with, all the little things in their everyday life that they now think about that they never did before November 30th, 2021. Being in large crowds, going to school, hearing loud noises. One of these survivors, He said that he can't even imagine a life as an adult living in a city where there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of people. I mean, that just limits their lives so much. And you can say that their futures were taken from them as well. I mean, they still get to live on this earth, but not in the same way they were here before. 
So some of the most powerful testimony that we play in our podcast is from Christy Gibson Marshall. She was next to Tate Muir as he took his last breaths. And she had known him since he was three years old because his mom would bring him to the school. He had two older brothers. And through tears, through gut-wrenching testimony and tears, she says it took her a year to get the taste of Tate's blood out of her mouth because she was trying to resuscitate him. I guess I've never listened to testimony from a school shooting like this before. And what really struck me is just how many people were in that hallway and were laying next to dead bodies. And one of the girls that speaks in the victim impact statement says that she was lying next to Hannah St. Juliana while she bled out. And another one says that I saw Madison get killed and I just don't understand like how you can move forward from that at such a young age to have something so serious happen. And that's why I think the terrorism charge was necessary, because if you really want to ensure that this person never gets out of prison, that's a good way to do it. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. We're talking to Jessica Lowther and Cooper Moll about the Oxford High School shooting. Up next, we talk about how the parents of a serial killer end up behind bars themselves. Let's talk a bit more about the shooter. Who was he, first of all? Let's paint the picture of him and his family. The shooter was, from what we understand, not your... I can't believe this is even a noun. You're a typical high school shooter. He was not a victim of bullying. He did fairly well in school, didn't stand out with his appearance. He was a loner. Other kids who testified, even though this is a small school in a small town, said they didn't know him. They recognized him, but couldn't put a name to his face sort of thing. But he was somebody that we see through his social media and texts, et cetera, who was very preoccupied with a fascination with firearms. And in his spare time, it seems that that was his main hobby and a hobby that he shared with his parents, that they would go to the shooting range together. They would test out different guns together. He was well-trained and skilled with guns. One thing that does end up coming out about him in his Miller hearing and the U.S. we have, if a juvenile is to be eligible for a sentence of life without parole, they need to go through a process called a Miller hearing. And in a Miller hearing is when it's proven whether or not there's a chance for this individual to be rehabilitated. And in the case of this shooter, they were not able to prove that he would be able to be rehabilitated and testimony given during this Miller hearing shared evidence of violent behavior in his past, uh, including torturing animals, journal entries, and recorded video of him talking about the pleasure that he experienced while torturing baby birds specifically, and that he often fantasized about violence. However, he also often experienced psychological torment There was part of him that we can see in his text messages that this was not always a comfortable place for him to be in his head, that he was hearing voices, seeing demons, thought his home was haunted, having abnormal paranormal experiences, expressing this concern to his parents that he wanted help, expressing this concern to the one friend that he had via text message that he wanted to go to a doctor, that He wanted help, and those cries for help did go ignored. But he was definitely somebody who was had an awareness that his ideations were not normal. But his parents, they knew he was struggling but ignored it. Do we know why? Do we know what that relationship looked like between the parents and son? It looked negligent. That's essentially the crux of this, is that they were held culpable for gross negligence that contributed to they're starting enacting this terrible attack. Well, one of the 911 calls that comes through when the shooting starts is from the shooter's dad. 
Can you talk us through that call and why that was so significant? James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly were actually at Oxford High School just an hour before the shooting takes place. What ended up happening was they were called to the school because their son had been drawing guns, bullets, blood, and dead figures on his math assignment. And this is not the first time something like this has happened. So Jennifer and James show up to the school. They meet with the counselor and they bring in the shooter and they all discuss what's going on with this worksheet. But by the time the worksheet got to the office, some things had been removed. Some things had been crossed out. And from what I understand, they were only there for like less than 20 minutes, I believe. And the counselor asks them if they would like to bring the shooter home, bring their son home. And they say they have to go back to work. And at no point does anyone check the shooter's backpack. There's conflicting reports about whether the backpack was in the room with them in the counselor's office or whether it was still in his classroom. But from the court testimony, we hear that the dean of students goes to get his backpack from the classroom and gives it back to the shooter, remarking that it seems very heavy and never even opens it up. And if he would have just unzipped it, you would have seen the gun right away. And so it's really mind boggling that this whole thing goes down with the math assignment. Jennifer had been called days before about him looking at violent videos on his phone, about looking up bullets on his phone. And she tells her son, next time, don't get caught. So there definitely seemed to be this vibe in this family that they weren't taking his issues seriously. And the main piece of evidence, I believe, here is that they bought him that gun four days beforehand. Now, the shooter says that this was his Christmas present. This is Black Friday. He and his father go to Acme Shooting Goods in Oxford, Michigan, and he gives his father money to buy the gun he wants. It's a Sig Sauer 9mm. Can I pause you there? What does that mean for... A non-gun person. Is that a big gun? It's a handgun. It kind of looks like one a cop would carry. Which I'll say is a bit different from previous mass shooting events here in the United States that have really called automatic assault rifles into question. So you see a lot of AR-15s, military weapons, etc. This was not that. And easy to hide in a backpack if it's just a little handgun. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the thing about the meeting in the office, in the counselor's office, was that they asked their son, you know, are you okay? Is there anything we need to be worried about? And he says, no, everything's fine. He doesn't indicate to them that he has this plan. He's recorded this video the night before that says he's going to shoot everyone he possibly can. And he definitely planned to shoot a lot of people because he brought a lot of magazines with him. So Jennifer and James leave the school. They go back to their work. James is a DoorDash driver. Jennifer works a cubicle style job and they go back to work. Within the hour, rumors start swirling that there is something going on at the high school. James Crumbly, one of the first things that he does is call 911 on his way back to his house to say, I think my son took the gun. I think he's the shooter. He's not worried that his son has been shot or that he is unsafe. He's not calling to report that there's a shooting. He's worried that his son is the shooter. Now, what does that tell you? They bought this gun four days before on November 26th with the shooter's money and it was his choice and you know it was just James and the son at the shooting thing but he went shooting with his mother the next day so she was a participant in this gun culture in the family too now in her testimony you'll hear that she says that James was responsible for keeping this gun locked up in the house and what the police find when they get to the crumbly house is the gun case open on the bed of the parents' bedroom, and the shooter had gotten it from their dresser, it was not locked. It was not kept in a safe place whatsoever, not kept away from their 15-year-old son. He had easy access to it. This is also apparent in many photos 
that are posted to social media and like through text messages that there are guns out in the background, like on the dining room table in so many. So it's easy to prove that they weren't safe about locking up their guns around their minor child. So James Crumley's in a panic. You know, it's hard to listen to that 911 call because you can tell he, he knows exactly what happened. And he sounds terrified, like, oh, crap, like, what have we done kind of thing? You know, I don't know if that's what he was thinking, but he and Jennifer are texting each other and Jennifer texts her son, don't do it. They know immediately. And so this is why we think that this case was deserving of a deep dive podcast because yes, this case is unprecedented for many, many reasons, but it was mostly that they were finally holding parents accountable for their minor children's actions. Now, when you think about that, just on the surface level, you're like, man, that's kind of crazy that like my kid can go out and do something and I can be held accountable. But when you really look at the details of this case, you really start to see why it's actually not that much of a precedence that being set because these parents were extremely negligent when it came to their child. There were reports that from the age of six years old, the child was left at home alone without access to his parents. He would be walking around the neighborhood, knocking on people's doors because he was scared. He was 10 years old with a cell phone texting his mother, asking her to come home and she wouldn't answer. He was being ignored. How quickly were the parents arrested and actually brought into the police station as suspects in this case? On December 3rd, three days after the shooting, with enough evidence coming to the surface that the parents could very well be held culpable in this case, Prosecutor Karen McDonald gives a press conference and announces that they're charging James and Jennifer Crumbly with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Warrants are put out for their arrests and they're nowhere to be found. Police show up at their house. They can't be reached via cell phone. Still no signs of them by nighttime. So at this point, the Oakland County Police have searched all of Oxford to no avail. And they call in a fugitive apprehension team and the U.S. Marshal Service for backup. Around 7 p.m. that night, the U.S. Marshal Service puts out a tweet with two kind of classic-looking wanted posters for both Jennifer and James Crumbly, you know, with a reward up to $10,000. This also becomes a huge national news story. And Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard appears in the first segment of, you know, every Fox, CNN, NBC, and show of that night, right? So at this point, the attorneys of the Crumbleys, Maria Lehman and Shannon Smith, get in contact with law enforcement and they assure them, hey, these two are just kind of getting their affairs together. They felt really concerned for their own safety. Even in Jennifer Crumbley's testimony, she says that they had been receiving death threats. They felt unsafe to stay in Oxford and says the reason they left was because they just didn't feel safe. However, what we find out they were kind of doing during that time is they had drained tons of money out of their bank accounts, including their son's bank account. They get burner phones, turn off their other cell phones. And just completely made a run for it, right? So finally, they were spotted about 45 minutes south of Oxford in a Detroit area warehouse building. Somebody who lived in that warehouse building saw their car backed into a parking lot, right? So backed in so that the license plate would be obfuscated. So they knew what they were doing. They send out a unit in Detroit. They are apprehended by the fugitive response team and a sworn of police invade this warehouse area and the Crumbleys are immediately taken into custody. So it's really this moment as well. I mean, this was a huge moment in this case because 
people don't run unless they have something to hide, right? And sadly, if you really think about it, and I'm not too sure that the shooter knew this was going on at the time, but this really also points to more evidence of their gross negligence, right? Here is their son in jail, you know, has been charged with terrorism, murder in the first degree, and they leave. What message does that send to a kid who already feels like and has goes on to express that he felt like his parents didn't care about him? I'm not saying this with sympathy for what he did, but if we are all growing up with this idea that our parents love us unconditionally, we'd hope that even when we royally screw up, our parents are still there for us and we always have that love to lean on. And here they are just leaving. So from there, they are brought back to Oakland County Jail. And they were initially denied bond because of their flight risk. Well, they'd already tried to run. Yes. But then they were held on a million dollar bond, 500K each, right? Yes. Which they could not come up with the money for. And we're not totally out of COVID yet. So the legal systems are totally backed up. So James and Jennifer Crumbly, I mean, they sat in jail for two years before they stood trial. One thing I just wanted to say, and it kind of goes with the theme of every time we talk to each other, Gemma, is the bad parenting. I am not a mother, but I have to think that if I had a teenager, I'd be really interested in what they were doing on their phone. And what they were looking at, what they were texting, what they were writing in their journals, and the fact that nobody was keeping an eye on this kid who was begging for help. He was begging for help. And you're not even slightly curious about what he's telling other people, even about you. Like, as his mother, you're not like thinking, like, I wonder if he thinks I'm a terrible mother. They don't even care. Does that become the main conversation in America when this side of the story breaks, the parental responsibility side? Yeah, I think that this case gained a lot of attention because of the gross negligence of these parents. But one thing that we were looking at in our research was the mother of Dylan Klebold, one of the Columbine shooters. That was the first big school shooting in American history, and that was in 1999, I believe. The mother of Dylan Klebold wrote a book about this experience. Now, she avoided the media for a few years after the shooting. You know, her son died by suicide in that shooting. So she finally came out of this situation going like, I want to help other people understand like how we ended up here. And one of the things that she says is like, we were a normal family. We were a normal upper middle class family. He had everything that he could have wanted. We were paying attention. And this still happened. And so it's not to say that there is a perfect way to parent kids. Of course, there's not a perfect way to parent teenagers, especially teenagers that are going through mental anguish. But it's really important that parents make an attempt to even figure out what's the difference between normal teenage angst and actual mental illness and actually root down to the cause of this. Because, you know, like Cooper said, we were coming out of COVID at this time in 2021. They had just gone back to school and they were still doing some days remote at Oxford. Some classes were still remote, but this was November of 2021. So they had just only been in school for about three months after being out at the end of the previous year. And when you're that age, that kind of social isolation really takes a toll. And especially on someone like the shooter who was already going through so much mentally and only having one friend probably plays a huge part in that because he felt like he couldn't talk to literally anyone, not even his own parents. Well, some of the details that were talked about in the shooter's proceedings showed the true premeditated nature of his offending. Can you take us through some of those? Some of them are too horrible to actually repeat, but some of that evidence that stood out to you, the fact that he had decided not to kill himself ahead of time, that he'd planned the shooting out in his journal, what kind of shocked you from hearing and witnessing all of that? One of the things that shocked me the most was... Not that I would direct anyone to do this, but comparing his plan 
what he envisioned doing specifically the execution style he had envisioned killing people in side by side with the autopsy reports of the murdered teenagers. It is eerily parallel. That to me is what stood out the most. And it's also was a huge part of his Miller hearing, which was his defense tried to argue that he was a uh, psychotic and the counter witness from the prosecution comes up and says, well, psychopaths, they act impulsively. They do not plan this out. There is not much premeditation here and precision and dedication to a blueprint. And most people experiencing a a level of psychosis or psychopathy, they're just kind of spraying bullets. There's no craft to what they're doing. And I know that sounds crude, but he really was concerned with a certain, certain vision he had for this. He also envisioned very strongly the repercussions, the fallout of this shooting. He wanted the families to be miserable. He wanted to see their misery. He wanted to witness it in the courtroom. He even says, when I go to trial for this, because I know I will, I'll go to, I know I'm going to go to prison for the rest of my life. And he's okay with that. And he says, I just want to see the looks on their faces when I've shot their child in the head. And one of the quotes from his manifesto, if we're going to call it that, is I have the chance to teach the world to become a better place. And I have to take that chance. I've missed many opportunities in my life. I'm not missing this one. I'm going to try to flee the school for as long as I can until I get caught. Just the thought of the silly people who've saved their whole life to go to college and have a great career, a family, grow old, die happily. They don't know that in less than a day, they're going to die. Their lives will be changed forever. I understand the consequences. I understand that I could go to prison for this. And I really say goodbye to everything. I'm sorry for manipulating you, mom and dad. You have trust in me and make sure that you have trust in me and I just owned you. And you should know that it's for a cause. I'm ruining my life, not yours. And then like he goes on to film another video just after this. It says like, fuck that previous video I took. That was bullshit. I'm going to have so much fun tomorrow. I have a goal and it's to kill everyone. Thankfully, he received the harshest possible sentence and was given life without parole in December 2023. What happened to the parents? Because that trial or their trials only recently wrapped up, really. Yeah. So Jennifer Crumbly went to trial first in February 2024. And this is after a lot of legal hearings and motions to decide whether she and her husband, James, would be tried together or separately. They have the same defense team. They're from the same law office. And so there's definitely like questionable things going on there. But ultimately what happens is they are tried separately. And it's because basically based on the evidence that they were presenting, there was different levels of culpability according to their lawyers. And so they wanted each person to have their fairest chance at a trial. And at Jennifer's trial, the school counselor speaks and dean of students speaks. They tell all the stories that we've told you about today, about the meeting earlier in that school. The ATF agent who reviewed Facebook messages between James and Jennifer says that they debated whether to buy this gun for their son. He walked the court through video. He discovered of the son using guns at the shooting range with his parents, as we mentioned before. And the most damning evidence was a video the shooter had sent his friend that made it undeniable that the parents were not always in the habit of securing their firearms, like we said earlier. And there's a gun on the table in the background of a photo. And so these are all pretty hard evidence, in my opinion, of their negligence leading up to this. But there's also testimony about the shooter texting his parents about paranormal experiences, seeing demons. Demons comes up a lot. And this is something that the Parkland shooter also talked about. And since he idolized the Parkland shooter, I do wonder about the manipulation of his parents and using this trigger word almost like to perhaps get off on a mental illness plea of some sort. And 
ultimately at Jennifer's trial, she ends up taking the stand, which a lot of people are like, oh no, oh no. What is she going to say? Because she's been openly emotional during this trial, even though she's not supposed to be. They are asked to suppress their emotions. And she was openly weeping at the beginning when they were showing the footage of her son going through the school and indiscriminately shooting people. But she takes the stand. And I'll never forget the first time I heard this quote was she was asked if she would have done anything differently. And she said no. What? She says no, and it's just like, you've dug your own grave here. You know, like, how can you say that in front of all of these victims, families, and these people who experience it themselves in front of the jury? And I mean, okay, she's telling the truth. On the stand, she wouldn't have changed anything. But one of the things that just has really stuck with me is as she said, I wish he would have killed us instead. Hmm. And I've sat there and wondered that many times is that it seemed like the most of the issues that this child had were with his parents. The Sandy Hook shooter killed his mother before going to the elementary school and killing 16 children. So it does make you wonder, like, what was the motive here? Because really, at the end of the day, no one's really clear as to why the shooter did any of this. And of course, our podcast is about this bigger question of like paying for the sins of your child and how monumental this case is when it comes to the parents being held accountable for their actions and rearing their child poorly and it culminating in this event. Both parents ended up receiving at least 10 years in prison. And lastly, I wanted to ask, do you think that this case has changed the way that people think about shootings or violent crimes committed by teens and children? Has this set a precedent that we can look to moving forward? Personally, I hope that the precedent that's set is that there's more investigation into the events that lead up to any of these events. Now, really, my dream is that this never happens again. But of course, I know I live in the United States. That's a pipe dream. And I'm going to say there's not a perfect parent in this entire world, but there are parents that are completely blind to what's happening in their children's mind or in their personal lives. And they go on and do these things. But I would bet my life that most of the children who end up doing these mass shooting events at schools, particularly their parents have some inkling that something is wrong with their child. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producers on this episode are Gia Moylan and Liv Proud. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.